I'm a feminist, but I'm interrupting the beginning of my own podcast to let you know that the Royal Albert Hall on the 7th of July, the big international headliner, I said we were flying in from America that I couldn't tell you about, I can now formally and officially announce, is Hannah Gadsby from Nanette. She's doing a full 20 minutes as the closing comedy of the Royal Albert Hall. Get your tickets now. There are still tickets left, but it's selling fast and now it is going to sell really, really fast. On top of that, we are having the closing speech from Amelia, the feminist theatrical sensation. If you saw it, you know what this means. It's the burn the fucking house down speech. Can you imagine that in the Royal Albert Hall with 5,000 guilty feminists in the audience? The roof is going to come off that ancient establishment. If you didn't get to see Amelia, this is the essence of what everybody was so absolutely thrilled and moved by. So this is your chance to see, if not the whole Amelia, the closing speech, which is absolutely the most remarkable thing I've ever seen in a theatre, I think. We've got guilty feminist favourites. We've got Ashling B. We've got Susan McComa. We've got Felicity Ward, Alison Spittle, Kima Bob and more doing things that, well, you've never quite seen them do before on The Guilty Feminist. We also have guests from Amnesty International and a little mini secret policeman's tour, including the four Yorkshire women, our update on the Monty Python classic, The Four Yorkshire Men. It really is going to be a spectacular celebration. We've got some actors doing the most hysterical, moving, shared reading that you've ever seen. And we've managed to get the incredible Hayley Atwell from Agent Carter, which is incredible. Juliet Stevenson from Truly Madly Deeply. Adjoa Ando, who did that amazing Richard II with all women of colour. And more. Now, we're announcing more names all the time. So watch our socials and listen to next week's podcast for even more announcements. We have a big song and dance number led by Kiri pritchard McLean and Jade Adams from A Musical, a show that where comedians do songs from musicals, with lots of Guilty Feminist favourites in that. It's going to be ridiculous, gorgeous, wonderful. We have music from the incredible Jess Robinson, who's doing like my favourite song ever, and it's just going to be so moving and beautiful and wonderful. And we have even more. Get tickets now. And also, while you're online getting tickets, go to hannahgadsby.com.au because she's doing an international tour of her new show, Douglas. So there'll be brand new material. It's the one after Nanette. I am beside myself to see it. She's going to Philadelphia next, all over America. And in October, she's playing the Royal Festival Hall in London. She's also in Oxford and Edinburgh. And I think there aren't many tickets left for those. So go on hannahgadsby.com.au right now. Find the place you're in. That's She's coming to Australia. She's coming to New Zealand. She's going all over Europe. So wherever you are, hannahgadsby.com.au. But I would get your tickets really soon because after Nanette, she's a super big deal. So also... You can see her do something wonderful and unique at the Royal Abbott Hall, 7th of July. Go to get tickets at guiltyfeminist.com and click through right now. And now, the podcast. I'm a feminist, but for my earlier show here at the Sydney Opera House today, I wore a bodice dress so fitted it took two stagehands and my co-host Geraldine Hickey to winch me into it. <laughs> And I'm only not wearing it now because the zip split in the speaker's lounge between shows. <laughs> Fortunately, I brought a backup gown. Genuinely. I thought I can't decide which one to wear. It's the opera house. You know, my mum's in. Make an effort. And so I brought two options. And thank God I did, because otherwise I would have had to just come out. And, like, I would have been worried the whole time the whole thing would have popped forward. And I mean, it would have been absolutely tits out on the table. Sorry, Geraldine. Why don't you do one? You're welcome. Um, I'm a feminist, but when I was trying to help Deborah into her dress, I gave up halfway through and went, you're on your own. <laughs> she did. Because later I said to someone, it normally only takes two people to get me into this dress. But it's a corset dress. It's meant to. You know, it's meant to take... A, I f it was like seven little Australians. I was being <laughs> winched in. There's a reference. Australian restaurants, local, local, sure. And <laughs> I thought it had taken three of them, and Geraldine went, nah, I gave up, walked away. Yeah. 
Didn't even know. I'm a feminist, but when I was performing in Melbourne at the Malthouse Theatre, it reminded both Cal Wilson and me of the prison set in Chicago, the musical, especially the movie version with Catherine Zeta-Jones and Renee Zellweger. And we wanted to stage. He had it coming then. (laughs) We weren't sure if it was a feminist song or just a song of misantry. (laughs) Do you know the song? It was basically about women murdering men. I mean, it's not a great song, really, to be honest with you, but it's a really good song. Won an Oscar. Um, And we wanted to stage it there. And I said to Cal, if we do get to do a show next year at the Sydney Opera House in the biggest room, we could fly in Pussy Riot the Russian punk band, to stage that number there and we could perform it with them. And then I said, but is it a good use of feminism to live out your punk musical theatre dreams? (laughs) I mean, it sounds like, oh yeah, we flew out Pussy Riot and it was this amazing moment, but really it would be so that I could perform a number from Chicago (laughs) with the most famous punk band in the world. I think that's okay. You'd buy a ticket. We've sold one ticket. Okay. I'm a feminist, but I don't know much about the suffragettes, including the correct pronunciation. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but when I made a video for Channel 4 News with my flatmate Steve about living with a refugee to encourage other people to share their spare rooms... I was pleased that of all the horrible, xenophobic, racist comments left on the internet under that video, not one person said I was ugly (laughs) or commented on my appearance in any way except one person who misunderstood and said we looked like a lovely couple. (laughs) Which I found flattering because while Steve is genuinely and 100%, I promise, like a brother to me, he is the most handsome man I've ever met in real life. I'm a feminist, but when my girlfriend talks about dismantling the dominant paradigm, I go, huh? Do you want to take apart a big wind chime? (laughs) It's very big wind chime, takes up a lot of space. It's too dominant in the backyard. Live from all of our... Host Geraldine Hickey and very special guest Kate Bowling talking about flying solo. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm trying to say that more normally, and every time I try, and it's like a horse coming to a fence and just think, just say it normally. No need to say undermine them, but I just can't stop myself now. I don't know how to say it normally now. Like, if I was just chatting in a sentence, I could say, yeah, I felt she undermined them. Oh, I've done it again. (laughs) Hello, Geraldine Hickey. Hello, Deborah. Hello. Listen, we've got a cake, Geraldine. It says, the guilty feminist, thank you for all that you are. Love and muffins. Chloe. Where is Chloe? Where is Chloe? Oh, did you bring my glasses out, by the way? Oh, yes. Thank you. I gave her a very important job. I, I thought you were going to say, I just sat down in them and broke them. Um, okay, so Chloe oh, says... Look at that. Oh, fuck what off. Is... They... <laughs> they are incredible. Oh, my God. I want one right now. Is that rude? No, wait. Look. <laughs> Sorry. Look at the size of them. Yeah, look at... No, look at my tiny hands. That's... <laughs> That's not a little dainty lady muffin, is it? That's a muffin for a fucking feminist. That's... <laughs> My, my, hmm? It's on purpose. It's, it's on, on purpose. purpose. Yeah. Are you Chloe? All of my love, yeah. Oh, thank Chloe, you, Chloe. Thank you so much. I'm genuinely... Oh, listen, I do nothing. I, basically, I just come on, admit that I'm a terrible feminist. Everyone else goes, thank God. Um, <laughs> and then we talk about how we can be a bit better tomorrow than we were today. It encourages people to hear that I'm... <laughs> that I'm, I'm 70% failing, but 30%... Come on, strengthen those muscles! <laughs> Please.
please put your hands together and welcome to the Sydney Opera House stage, the wonderful Geraldine Hickey! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to begin with, can I just get a, a round of applause from all the people that are single? All the single people, round of applause? Right. Uh, suck shit. Uh, uh, suck a big one. Um, oh no, you can't because you're single. Uh, I'm not single, it's so great. It's the best. I'll tell you the top two best things about being in a relationship. Top two best things. Number one, lift to the airport. <laughs> it's every time. No problems. Number two, best thing about being in a relationship, so I'm going to pick you up from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> It's not all sunshine and lollipops, though. Um, like, for example, um, my partner and I, sometimes we travel together and... <laughs> we have to organise a lift to the airport and it's... It's really hard. I do understand that, you know, why we're very happy in a relationship now, things are great, but there might come a time where... We break up. People break up. It could happen. And I'm OK with that because I know that we'll remain friends afterwards. And I know that because that's just what lesbians do. <laughs> like, I have to. <laughs> like I, otherwise, I could never go to Bunnings again. I love travelling, but I have, you know, a bit of travel anxiety. Like, just a round of applause if you have to check more than once a flight details before you click confirm. Everybody. How many do you have to do? At least four. That's pretty good. Mine's five. <laughs> But, you know, I have all different travel anxieties and stuff. And for me, like, the biggest one is travelling in a group with no leader. <laughs> you need a leader. <laughs> I don't know if you've been on those trips to Bali <laughs> with your mates and everyone's like, what do you want to do? Oh, no, I'm easy. I'm easy, yeah. <laughs> no, just go with the flow. What do you want to do? No, yeah, what do you want to do? And then you just sit at home bored all the time. Like... <laughs> You need a Nicole in your life. You need Nicole to come in. Who's Nicole? She's the fucking organiser. <laughs> she comes in right, right, oh, girls, this is what we're doing. We're getting up. Buffet finishes at Tempe. You need to get there before 8 30 because that's when they stop cooking the pancakes, right? Then we're going to shuttle bus leaves at 10 30. We're going to be on that first one because it's two hours of shopping. And then, we're, and then we're, I found a nice place. It's off the beaten track a little bit, but it's got great reviews on TripAdvisor. We're going to go there. Then we come back to the hotel where it's afternoon and bingo. Then into your tops, into the pool for the poolside bar. Two for one cocktails for three hours. Come on. Like, <laughs> need it. I was in Vietnam at a friend's wedding, so it was a group, and I found out how anxious I was about having no leader. Like, I'd heard that there was a cocktail cruise. Someone had mentioned there was a cocktail cruise that night, and I'm like, oh, yeah, let's... Oh, cocktail cruise, great. <laughs> I wanted to be on that fucking cocktail cruise. Um, but I had to downplay it. Like, everyone was just being very relaxed about it. And I was like, oh, hey, <laughs> hey, when's the... Um, when are we going on the cocktail cruise? Like, what, what, time's, what time's that going? He's like, oh, let's relax. Here, have a mojito. Come on. We're on holidays. What are you stressing for? That's how you dance. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, yeah, cool. I'll drink that. And then, you know, like 15 minutes later, I'm like, oh, hey. Should we be going now for the cocktail... Shut up, you're so stressed. Yeah, have a Cosmo. Ugh. Oh, yeah. And then it's like, all right, yeah, we better go. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Does anyone know the way? Which way do we go? We go, no, I don't know. Come on, we just follow them. Don't worry about it. Come on, let's go this way. And then you get to, like, we got on the ship. And we're like, just, is this, I don't know if this is the right boat. I don't, I don't know if this is the, is this the right, I don't feel, this doesn't scream cocktail cruise to me. Like, it just, Come on, no, relax, this is fun to blow. Wind the bar, they let us on, didn't they? Come on, let's go, let's go. Ooh, I hope they've got Tia Maria. Uh. 
and then we got killed by pirates. Um, <laughs> that's why it's better sometimes to travel alone. The end. Thanks very much. I've been Johnny. <laughs> Hello, Guilty Feminists. Hello, I'm Margaret K. Bond-Smith. I'm Jessica foster Q. You know us off this podcast Yay! you're in the middle of listening to. Yay! We are here because we want to tell you about a play that we're both in called Brexit. Don't be put off by the name. No, it's nothing um, like the real Brexit. No, it's actually really good. It knows what it is. It lasts an hour and 15 minutes. Rather than a lifetime. <laughs> a lifetime potentially. of hell. Um, it's very sort of clever and funny, and it is quite feminist, isn't it? In the sense that we're both very, we're, um, high, very status, high status yeah. women in it. Neither of us are in bikinis. No, I've, got, I've been allowed a suit for it and, yes. um, a long time ago. Trouser suit. Trouser suit. Yeah, you as well. Yeah. So, there are no skirts in yeah. this. Is it, it's more guilty than feminists to say feel quite sexy in a trouser suit. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I no it's just that we're not used to having any power no, at all. No, we're not used so to having any exciting. power as comedians and actors. <laughs> well, a long time ago, I did a law degree and I've had friends from university see the press pictures for this play and say, the road not taken. <gasps> and, um, of course you could have been. In a way, there. I'm basically, this is as close, being in this play is as close as I'll ever get to making my mum happy with my <laughs> career. So please come and watch it. Please come and support us. It's brilliant, funny, clever, clever play. <laughs> and there's a special offer for Guilty Feminist listeners. All tickets are only £15 with the offer code BREXIT15. Yep, go to kingsheadtheatre.com for tickets and we will buy you drinks afterwards. That's a bit much, that won't happen. Not guaranteed. No, not guaranteed. Our guest today is from Brooklyn, New York, teaches writing at NYU, which sounds so fancy to us, doesn't it? Because it's so far away and so glamorous. She is also the author of the best selling book, Spinster Making a Life of One's Own. Put your hands together and go crazy for Kate Bolick! <laughs> Kate, Kate, Kate. Would you like some water or a muffin? I am tempted by those muffins. I'll push them closer to you, and then you can have a little... Mm. I mean, they are good. They're beautiful. I know. And they're fisters. That's <laughs> why I like... No. The word fist has been used too many times. Kate, do you have an I'm a feminist part? I think I have three. Pitch them so, to us. So, okay, my first one is, I'm a feminist, but... On the plane ride here from New York, even though the man seated next to me, who was so nice, and kept talking and talking, and tell, he told me his entire life story, how his parents met each other, how he met his wife, all before we even took off. Oh, God. Oh, God. Uh, and would go about in a very long-winded way <laughs> and kept losing his point. Even though this was happening, I never stopped him and said, I'm actually going to read a book or something. Oh, my I let God. let him keep talking. The whole time? Well, I mean, for that whole, like, Episode. 40 minutes, yeah, that that went on. So wow. that's one. Uh, the, uh, the other one is, I'm a feminist, but I spend a great deal of time worrying about VPL. Oh, <laughs> Visible panty line yes. for the uninitiated. Yes, yes. I, Your own or others? <laughs> I worry about others. I want to, when I see it on others, I want to go tell them the kind of seamless underwear to buy. Can you see? <laughs> you're okay, you're, you're okay. Thanks. Yes. I don't know that I am in this dress, so I'm not going to stand up. I've tried to wear seamless underwear, but I don't know that I've... I don't think mine's ever seamless. It just isn't. I just... Uh, no, move on, do another one. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> I am a feminist, but I am so convinced by the life-changing powers of my new shampoo oh. that I can't stop talking about it. To I know whoever that will listen to me, it's as if I'm being paid and I am not being paid. <laughs> okay, what is the shampoo? See, I feel like I shouldn't say it because I'm not getting paid. No, go and tell us, because we need to know the secret now. I know, okay. It's called Hair Story. Does anyone know this? Hair Story? That's the brand, and it's called New Wash. It's a whole new way of shampooing your hair. <laughs> they should be paying you. Should... I... I'm going to try it. It's I'm... changed my life. 
Hair story, I'm going to take a note of that. I mean, it's being recorded. I don't need to take a note of it. <laughs> Hair story, new wash. So you've written this book. And basically, this is my summation of this book. Being single as a woman is not a second prize. That you kind of, you can be happy anyway. It's a different first prize. Yeah, I love how you put it like that. It's yeah. a different first prize. So when Jennifer Aniston splits up with Justin Throw, everyone goes, oh, poor Jen. Poor Jen, sad again, sad again. Oh, poor Jen, not pregnant again, not with a man again. Oh, God, first there was Brad, and then there was, what was the other one? Oh, who knows, Matt? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's all right, though. But she's, yeah, that she's finding her own happiness in the world and it doesn't necessarily need a man slash partner to make her happy. Tell us more about why you believe that being single as a woman can be a first prize and in a very real way convince me and Geraldine to leave our partners. I am a feminist, but <laughs> instead of talking about my book, I want to talk about your eyeglasses and how amazing they are. Has ever, have people seen these? They're little... Yeah, they've got legs instead of arms. Yeah, they've got little, little heels on the end. They're amazing. Yeah, they're sweet. They're French. I bought these. I'll tell you why I bought these, actually. We should talk about the thing, but... Uh, okay, I'll tell you the story. So my optometrist, Rod Dale, used to be my neighbour, but knows everyone in show business. So the reason I go to him, I call him Rod Dale Optometrist of the Stars. Yes. Because all of his clients are really famous, and he knows all these famous people. And one day, I was in Rod Dale Optometrist of the Stars optometry shop, and I was choosing new reading glasses, and I saw these, and I thought they were super cute. And Catlin Moran came in, who's one of his famous buddies slash clients. And... We started chatting, and Rod said, oh, this is Deborah, and I said, oh, yes, Kat, and we've got friends in common, and, you know, it was being super chill. <laughs> and just like, sure, we'll be, we'll be good friends. And, uh, and then she saw these glasses, and I said, I'm thinking about buying these, and she said, oh, my God, you've got to. They're fabulous. And so I said, because I wanted to be, you know, all cool in the gang, I said, oh, I'll take them, and then Rod told me the price, and I went, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I couldn't back out I couldn't back out I mean I wasn't going to spend that on reading glasses but there was no chance to not so I just had to put two credit cards down and say spit it and, <laughs> and then just back out of the shop and then once they've made them up you can't take them back they've made them up with your eyes on them so yeah, I've, I've got these they were more than one wants to spend on eyeglass, uh, reading glasses but you know what I've had a lot of use out of them and everyone admires the heels on them so I'm fine with it now but I will admit to you that And now I you've bought... talked about it so you can claim it on tax. <laughs> <laughs> I, bought them, I bought them so that Kat and Moran would think I was cool. I'm a feminist, but <laughs> I've overspent on glasses to impress another feminist. Tell me about your book, because it sounds so cool. It's like the history of single women, isn't it? Yes, and maybe one way of putting it is that when I think about the spinster. So it's called Spinster, right? That's the name of the book. And when I think about a spinster, rather than thinking of a lonely old lady who with lives cats. with too many cats, mm. I think of an inscrutable woman who lives alone in her house and nobody knows what's going on behind that door. And she's doing anything she wants. She's totally free. Mm. And that that's good. how I think about the single life. Mm. Are you single? Not anymore. I've hung up my spinster spurs. Are you now not a good advertisement for your own book, though? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's that tricky. That feels to me. Yeah, it's tricky. Are you trying to keep your partner under wraps? Have I blown this cover now? No, it's out. It's out. It's, it's, it's out. Blown. He's in the book. I mention him in the book. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about the history of single women. Who are the single women that we should look to as kind of icons of... Well, I like to start it in the Middle Ages because that's when single women became more visible because there are more of them. And they were nuns and they were witches and they were prostitutes and they were also spinsters or spinners, which were the women who were spinning wool into thread. So at the time, the term spinster was just a neutral occupational descriptor like baker or fishmonger. Oh. It didn't become negative until the 17th century in America when the colonists were trying to form a new country and everybody had to be on board producing new citizens. So as soon as you became a fertile age, you were supposed to be popping out babies, like, or until you ran out of your fertility, or until you died, whichever came first. Often well, you usually, died first. Yeah, yeah, you died of childbirth, you, yeah. Exactly. And you, you also, you know, in the end, if you were 
lucky and lived, you had something like 8.2 children, but you actually were pregnant a lot more than that, but all of those died in infancy. So it was just a terrible time. But So anyway, if you weren't with that program by the age of 23, you were a drain on society, a menace, a spinster. And then if by age 26, you still were not married and procreating, you were a thornback, which is a species of flat spiny fish. Oh. Yeah, in ancient Greece, there were tiers of prostitutes, and the highest tier had rights that most married women didn't have. Yeah, so yeah, it was a no, pretty I good could... gig for them. Yeah. yeah, And there are many sex workers around the world today who are empowered, and actually I got an email from a sex worker recently. At some point, I think I must have said, uh, you know, it's not really a choice for many sex workers. And a sex worker wrote to me and said, it is a choice for many sex workers. So if you're going to say that, can you also say it is an empowered choice? So I just want to be kind of clear about that, that I don't want to sort of go, oh, you know, God, non-sex worker, same thing. I'm getting into a bad place now. <laughs> if you are a nun and you're listening, do nuns listen to the Guilty Feminist? I reckon some Absolutely must. fucking lutely they would. No. <laughs> Okay, so we want to include, if you're a nun, if you're a sex worker, if you are a witch uh, or, or a spinner, if you spin cotton, I genuinely am not, I'm not going, oh, joke, joke. I genuinely do want to include all of our listeners and all feminists and all women. Do you think for many women, being a nun was a way out of this sort of consistent childbirth that went oh, on? Oh, absolutely. Especially if you didn't have any money. And so if you were a poor woman, getting married just meant you were being a slave and a housekeeper to that guy. So the convent looked like a much nicer way of life. They are nice buildings. <laughs> they are. And you have those nice wimples and things. Yeah. yeah. It was probably quite hard living convents as well, though, wasn't it? Because there wasn't much food and it was cold in some convents. True. And, and there to... was self-flagellation yeah, yeah, yeah. And early mornings. Yeah. I, don't, so, I don't think it was a walk in the park. I think, <laughs> I think you... I mean, you're definitely not dying in child... Not, you're actually not definitely not dying in childbirth because things went on. But well, we can flash forward. Please. To... God, please. <laughs> I'm in a Maya gang. I'm in a Maya. I don't know how much of this we can put out, to be honest with you. <laughs> Without excluding. The first really great positive moment for single women was the 1890s. Because of industrialization, there was a bottomless need for workers and teachers. And for the first time in history, women were leaving home and moving to cities and taking these jobs, living by themselves, working, not having husbands. And they were called the new woman. And they were pictured, you know, in the popular press, in illustrations and so forth, because it was before, you know, I don't know, whatever. It was, you know, like, they drew pictures. <laughs> In their Full magazines. Photos. Oh, I see, cartoons, like, yeah, 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 yeah. like little illustrations of yeah. the new woman. Yeah, yeah. And so they, so if we're going to travel in time, if we ever get in a DeLorean or similar, we should not go back before 1890 yeah. as women. Yeah. 1890 yeah. is the first year it's safe for us to visit. Yes, yeah. It's, it was a really good time. Yeah. So 1890 was the new woman, and that was to do with, well, same as Dickens, you know, uh, like great expectations, being able to get on a train, go somewhere new, get to London if you were a Dickensian. And upward mobility, that's what Great Expectations is all about. It's about upward mobility and being able to take a job. And that was more available for women as well. So who's your favourite new woman? Well, the, one of the new women I write about in my book is named Neith Boyce. N-E-I-T-H. She was named after an Egyptian goddess. And she wrote a column for Vogue magazine, the Vogue we all know today, in the year 1898, called The Bachelor Girl, about her decision to never marry. So she was basically Carrie Bradshaw 100 years before Carrie Bradshaw, what? but way better than Carrie Bradshaw. If you're listening, Sarah Jessica Parker. No offense. Who, I mean, no, you're also great. She is, um, she is so great. I've met her. She's so nice. You've met her. You've had a lovely cosmopolitan with her, and now you're saying there's a much better one of her... <laughs> in 1890. I'm separating the actress from the... Okay, great, great, great. Yeah. Good, good point, good point. Okay, great. Yeah, so Neith's story is that so she's one of these new women. She, when she was in her early 20s, she moved to New York City to live alone and become a writer in the 1890s. That's exactly what she did. She worked on newspapers, wrote this column, wrote novels. Uh, and then, much to my dismay, I learned after doing a lot of digging, that whole year she was writing the column for Vogue, she was also being hotly courted by an handsome anarchist 
labor writer named Hutchins Hapgood. Oh, I've already fallen in love with him. <laughs> a labor anarchist called Hutchins Hapgood. Yeah. And, the ne- and, the, she, and she married good. him. She married him. So that was disappointing to discover. Oh, but she's let us all down. <laughs> I know that's let the whole school down. But that's kind of a, but she married him on the condition that they have an open marriage. Oh, okay. She's back in favour. <laughs> but oh god, what, <laughs> I can't take the turns, guy. <laughs> what that really turned out to be was they bought a big house in Connecticut. She pumped out four kids, Ugh. and he traipsed around Sorry, the country. I shouldn't make that face for children. Having sex today. with working women and writing home letters about it because that was the erotics of their relationship to him. So, so he was just like home changing diapers while Hutch so slept he, around America. So, so he was like writing back down, this is what you're missing out on. Yeah, yeah. That's extraordinary. So the open marriage was a one-way street, really, yeah. because she had four she children. She was so busy with the kids. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Men get all the good stuff, don't Seriously. they? Historically. Yeah. yeah. And I get yeah. these muffins. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of these muffins will be going to a man. <laughs> so basically, this is the history of women who went alone or tried to go it alone. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And where do you think? That leaves women in the 21st century. What's the recommendation of going it alone now? Where's the excitement in it and the power in it now? Well, here's the thing. I, what I have come to decide is that this whole question that I was vexing myself with all through my 20s and 30s is like, should I get married? Should I stay single? I don't want you know, like marriage seems like death. But single, I'll wind up a lonely old spinster. Like, what do I do? What do I do? And then I realized that actually is a false binary here in the 21st century. We all live in a third space where it's not about those two questions anymore. Most people are serial and monogamists, even if that means that you're married and divorced and remarried and, you know, going on like that. But relationships are just very fluid and it's not, we don't need to be thinking about them in that kind of rigid way. The other way that I like to think about this is that Back in the day, like when my mother, you know, was finishing college and dating, dating was a pretty good time because you just did it for a couple of years and you were like trying to make a really fast decision. So courtship was kind of fun and then you find your guy and you get married and it's done and you're 24. There you go. Now we continue to act like this period after college is this dating phase of our lives, but it lasts now like 10, 15 years, which is a lot of wasted time, I think. And a lot of anxiety goes into dating apps and, oh, am I finding someone or am I not? And so in the spirit of all about women, I would say that for the first time in history, women have more occupational, vocational, educational opportunities than ever before. So many stereotypes and stigmas have fallen away. We have so many freedoms. And now is the time to enjoy them and to enjoy our single lives as well as we can. So, yeah, agreed. So you're saying the goal of Tinder is not to find a permanence. The goal of Tinder is Tinder. Oh, yeah. Tinder just keeps us in a state of constant, unconsummated desire. Because even if we do, the Aziz Ansari thing, that really encapsulates modern dating to me today. Like, what was, so, are, we're all, are we all aware of this? Yes. Yeah, so what that story was to me was just about how common and familiar it was. Like, so many of us have been in that kind of situation where you go out for dinner with a guy and you go back to his place and the next thing you know, he's like... But I think that can be true if you've been in a relationship for 10 or 20 years. Sex is not always consensual, even if we are permitting it. And that's the conversation we need to start having. Oh, yeah. And it's uncomfortable to admit to your friends, if you're with a sexual partner, that it's not as great as you want it to be. It is, it's a really hard conversation to have. So the single option means that I think we can boldly say more, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. If I don't feel like sex, I don't have to have it. Yeah. If I do feel like sex, there's ways and means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I don't want to date, I don't have to date. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, don't... I can have sex without dating, yeah. or, I, or I can date without having sex. Or if or... I just want to fucking stay at home and watch TV. Right. <laughs> Right. 
Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Jessica Regan here from the Big Speeches Workshop. You might remember an episode last year called Women Fighting on Stage and Screen, episode 118, where Jessica Hines talked about her brilliant film, The Fight. And I talked about a play I was in called The Sweet Science of Bruising that looked at female underground Victorian boxing. I am delighted to tell you that The Sweet Science of Bruising is back and it's bigger and better than ever. It's on at the Wilton's Music Hall, the venue of our dreams, running for the whole month of June. It is the fierce, fabulous feminist play of my dreams. And it has a female writer, a female director and a largely female cast. So if you would like to support some feminist art anytime soon, please do come along. It is a wonderful, passionate, beautiful cathartic play and I really think you'd enjoy it. So tickets start at 12.50 and I'd love to see you there. Thank you. Bye. Everybody here at the Sydney Opera House, would you please welcome to the stage Deborah Francis White. Our theme tonight is flying solo. And I think sometimes we're alone because we don't include ourselves. Like, we assume we're not included. You know, when big corporations, they always talk about diversity and inclusion. Diversity means people who are different. And really, what they mean, you know, if it's a big company, they mean women. That's what D&I means. Diversity and inclusion. D&I. Women. That's what they're thinking of in their heads. And sometimes now they make efforts. They kind of go, oh, but we've also got an LGBTQ network. They're allowed a day. And... uh, (laughs) But it's harder to have targets for things that are outside gender. I often think about, we wait to be included. And I think increasingly with the Me Too movement and other things that are happening right now in the world, women are sort of more, I think, demanding inclusion and certainly suggesting they have it. And and it's good to be able to include ourselves. I sometimes think that we are so poor at including ourselves. Children are great at including themselves. Children are so great at including themselves. If any of our small children... Has anyone got a child or knows a child? (laughs) Just give us a cheer if you've got a child. Not that many, because you're out on a Sunday night. Sure, it's late. Uh, Just some people going, oh, yeah, oh, the fuck I have, actually, yeah. No, sure. (laughs) Should be at home. Uh, What time did the baby sit at home? Probably still alive. Uh, Just give us a cheer if you know a child. Great, yeah. Um, If any of our four-year-old children behaved the way we behaved at a networking event, at a playgroup, we would take them to a therapist (laughs) and have them seen because we would worry that they were socially incapable because children assume inclusion, four-year-olds certainly. A four-year-old walks into a playgroup, goes, there's some children there, there's some blocks, more blocks than children, I reckon I'm in there. (laughs) And they go over, they just start playing with the blocks, they include themselves in the game. Unless they're told otherwise, they just start building a building. And the other kid will say, oh, I'll build something with you. And they'll leave them there an hour and they'll come back and they'll go, oh, we built this and we built a train and we built a spaceship. And they probably don't even know the other kid's name. They don't bother with pleasantries. There's no changing of business cards. (laughs) But they just include themselves. And if that four-year-old behaved the way we behave at a networking event, we would be concerned if they came into the room and went, some blocks and some children. Get a bit closer, see if... One of them catches my eye. That's <laughs> no, not, not looking. Okay. I think I'll just send an email. I think I'll just... We would be worried. We would be worried. It's our adolescence where this inability to include ourselves kicks in. Do you remember assuming inclusion in a group of cool teenagers and discovering that they did not agree that you were included? It's the worst feeling in the world. It's the worst feeling in the world. Your family are basically people who are legally obliged to include you. That's who they are. If you have a partner, that's why you have them. Because, I mean, it's certainly why you'd bother to get married now. I mean, there's no point getting married now because you could just live with people. What's the point of solidifying it? It's only an archaic contract so that a man could pass a woman's property to another man. I mean, that's what it's for. Why do we do it now? We do it because if you're formally married, it costs money for someone to exclude you wake up and think, oh, I'd have to do a lot of paperwork to exclude you now. So I really think twice about it. So when you're at your most annoying, it's so tricky for them to exclude you. That's why we do it. 
I mean, there's the party in the white dress, and those things are fun, and we enjoy them or we don't, and if we are the kind of person that enjoys them, great. But mostly it's so you're difficult to exclude, <laughs> to the point of legally problematic to exclude. <laughs> Your family are legally obliged to include you to the extent where you can include yourself as a surprise. <laughs> that is how solid that is. If you said to your mum, or if you don't have a mum, fill in whoever the person in your life is like your mum. And say you said to your mum that you weren't coming home for Christmas, you weren't able to, or whatever you celebrate at whatever time of the year, big family anniversary or another sort of festival. So for the sake of argument, say it's your mum and it's Christmas, and you've said to her, I'm not going to be in town this Christmas, I'm going to be away. And then on Christmas Eve, you thought, you know what, I can get there now. So you just thought, I'll fly home and I'll, I'll surprise my mum. I don't want her to know I'm coming. When you knock on the door on Christmas Eve, and your mum opens the door, she can only have one reaction. <laughs> there is literally one possible reaction that she can have. And that has to be, oh my God, I did it, it's your mum, you're here, I can't believe you're here, oh my God, come in, come in, come in. That's the only, that's literally the, she cannot open the door and go, oh, oh you said you weren't, okay, could you just wait here for a second, just, yeah. <clears throat> Well, she's here. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. She's... Well, I suppose there's that sofa bed in the other. Oh, well, I don't know. What are you doing? Forgot it's turkey now. I don't know. know. Yep. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess you better come in. And some of you are looking at me like, well, my mum, my mum would do that. In which case, I'm going to suggest you don't surprise that mum. If you've got a mum who would do that, you would never surprise her, because you do not show up unannounced including yourself in places that you are not guaranteed enthusiastic inclusion. I can't surprise the Oscars with my presence. <laughs> Stand up and go, it's me! Surprise! Because they're going to go, you're not included, you're not on the list, you're not coming in. And then there's a falling feeling there at that point, isn't there? <laughs> Even though I've got a posh frock on and it is the Oscars tonight, they'd just be like, no, no. So I can't do that. So wherever you're happy to surprise people is a place you're guaranteed to be included. So think now of the amount of places in the world that you can show up unannounced, knowing you will be enthusiastically overly included. How many places is that? One max. Now, <laughs> maybe two, maybe two. You might, who reckons they've got more than two places they could show up unannounced? Two people there? Where is your place? That you, are you the muffin lady though? Because that's not, you're the muffin lady. Okay, you're the lady that makes free muffins. Of course you can turn up fucking anywhere. <laughs> You could turn up anywhere. The trick is how to get people to include you when they don't want to include you. So I just want to tell you this story. I was going to give one of these corporate seminars that I do for businesses, women in business, and they said, look, we really want you, but you're going to have to get past Janet because she has final sign-off. And Janet does not like women. <laughs> Even though she's involved with the Women's Network, she does not like women at all. In fact, she doesn't like anybody but she especially doesn't like women because she's got to the top on her own and she's done it hard and she didn't get any help from anyone and she's not helping anyone else. And she especially doesn't like confident women or women that present in any way as powerful uh, or dynamic or forward thrusting. She doesn't enjoy a forward thrusting woman. And they said to me, they said to me, the chap involved said, look, you can go and his name was Graham. And he said, you can go and talk to Janet because I really want you to do it. Please go and talk to Janet, but she's not going to sign you off. I already know it's such a shame because just go in and have a chat to her but she's not going to sign you off because she doesn't like a forward thrusting woman and that's what you are and I said if Janet is so mean why do you keep Janet on why is she still here and he said oh she's a rainmaker you see but they'll never get rid of Janet because she is so good with clients she's not like this with clients she's amazing with clients she loves clients she brings in more money than anybody else so I said okay so I walked in and I said hello I'm Deborah she said yes I'm Janet with a face that said I suspect you are forward thrusting <laughs> you will not be thrusting your way in here <laughs> and I said I know Janet I've heard all about you Graham said that you were the main rainmaker of this company and without you really they weren't going anywhere and she went did he did he now you have to take into account that Janet doesn't like people so she knows that her reputation is that she's mean so nobody ever says anything nice to or about Janet this was like a little crack. You could see her little heart open and go, someone said something nice about me. And I thought, the thing is, Janet is not a nasty person. She's a vulnerable person. She feels she's done it hard. And I said, oh, yeah, Graham said you're the main rainmaker. And she went, oh, I suppose I. 
and then we talked and I was very forward thrusting. I didn't in any way undercut my own thrust for Janet. And uh, we had a back and forth and she said, I really like you. I can't wait for you to come in and do something. And I said, great, let's do it. And as I walked out the door, as just as I was about to go, she went, what else did Graham say? <laughs> That's right. Janet will include you if you will include Janet. The most difficult people are always the easiest people. You just need to know you don't want to include them because they don't include anyone, but they're more desperate to be included than anyone. They are basically the four-year-old who goes into a playgroup and goes, maybe there's more children than blocks. I'll just send an email. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shop and the Sydney Opera House. Thanks to everyone at All About Women Festival as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Thank you so much. I've been Deborah Francis White. You've been wonderful. That's our show. Good night. What, what happens at the 23 year old mark what, what do you become spinster a spinster yeah. and that's and that was but that originally that word meant spinner yeah. because some women who were single spun silk it was, it was really the only it was the only uh, respectable way to, to work outside of the home outside of you know so you could be a prostitute a nun or a witch or a spinster and so, if a, so, sorry say a sex worker a nun <laughs> yeah uh, a, a, a witch which is was really witch a job though or was that more of a slur <laughs> I think of a witch I can as... See, I can see sex worker, I can see none. I can't see witches of an occupation. Witches are herbal My... entrepreneurs. What? Herbal... Yeah, oh, well, like herbal, herbs, mate. Herbal entrepreneurs. Yeah. Got my herb stand. <laughs> I can see... That's what you would have gone well, for, the sun's Jardine. out, but I put my wide-brimmed hat on. <laughs>